It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Premier. The Premier told the Integrity Commissioner that he does not recall speaking with Sergio Mancha about changes to government land use policies, and yet new documents revealed this week show that the Premier met with Mr. Mancha at a, on at least two occasions before announcing changes to the Greenbelt, changes that benefited Mr. Mancha. One was a fundraiser for a fellow caucus member, the member from flamborough glanbrook so to the Premier, how many other government members have had fundraisers with people who are looking for preferential treatment from this government? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, like any party, including the NDP over there and the Liberals and the Green and ourselves, for decades you go to fundraisers, you meet hundreds of people, they chat with you. But you know, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what the people of Ontario are concerned about right now. They aren't, they aren't concerned about what the leader of the NDP is saying. They're concerned about the carbon tax. They're concerned about their mortgage when they're about to lose their house next year or the year after when they have to renew it. They're concerned about the groceries and the gas bills. Mr. Speaker, I just went to an opening over at Costco, met hundreds and hundreds of people, and every single one of them said, just keep going. Make sure you, you protect our backs. Make sure you lower the cost and the burden on the backs of the taxpayers. And that's what we're doing. We're making sure that we're lowering the gas tax by 10 cents. We got rid of those tolls on the 412 and 418. We're making sure Tons. that we're giving 1.1 million low-income uh, folks in, the, in Ontario a tax break. We're going to continue doing that. So we're going to focus on making sure we're fiscally prudent with taxpayers' money, and we're going to be cutting taxes, not worrying about what you the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I think people of Ontario are very concerned that their government is under criminal investigation by the RCMP. Yeah. Yeah. So, I know. Uh, and, 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 Speaker, this government's questionable fundraising is very well known to the people of Ontario. They've been warned and even cautioned on multiple occasions by officers of the legislature and even Elections Ontario about their fundraising practices. The Integrity Commissioner revealed that the Premier's fundraiser-in-chief was selling tickets to the infamous uh, Ford family Stag and Doe to developers with business before the government. Those developers at the event succeeded in getting their properties removed. So to the Premier, was the Premier aware that his top fundraiser was peddling stag and doe tickets to developers who were lobbying the government? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Actually, I think it was the member for uh, uh, Kitchener who was actually singled out as having used uh, government resources to uh, raise funds. But having said that, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue. Waterloo, excuse me, Waterloo. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Speaker, what matters is exactly what the Premier said, that we continue to double down on ensuring Order. that we can build 1.5 million homes across the province uh, of Ontario. The Leader of the Opposition, of course, uh, uh, talks about fundraising. I guess I could ask her the same thing. When Silvio de Gasparis gave you $1,000 to the NDP, what did you promise him? Oh. Uh, oh. 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 We stopped the clock. Ask the Leader of the Opposition to take your seat. Okay. I believe the standing orders indicate that questions go to the government, <laughs> not the reverse. But uh, at the same time, I would encourage all members to, um, to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Well, from official plans to the green belt grab to MZOs, we have a chaotic and speculator-friendly government driven by this premier. We're hearing of hidden phone records, deleted emails, secret USB keys, brown envelopes, backroom deals, and even cash for access events hosted by sketchy speculators. So Order. back to the premier, is this how Order. business is done in his government? Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, one of the uh, people that she accuses of being a sketchy speculator, excuse me, uh, are the Gasparis. Now, having said that, they've built a lot of homes across the, the province of Ontario, and hopefully they will continue to do so. I wonder if she thinks that Carlo de Gasparis, who also made a $1,000 donation to the NDP, is sketchy as well, Mr. Speaker. 
I wonder what the Leader of the Opposition promised both Silvio de Gasparis and Carlo de Gasparis for the now $2,000 donations that we have found that went to that party, Mr. Speaker. What we're going to continue to do, Mr. Speaker, is ensure that we continue to build 1.5 million homes, working with people like uh, like the de Gaspers family who are building homes across Ontario and other home sure. builders who want to do so, Mr. Speaker. But then again, I asked the Leader of the Opposition. The NDP has accepted $2,000 in donations from the very same people she now calls sketchy, Mr. Speaker. If she has a third question, I might highlight some of the additional donations. <laughs> The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Um, just two days ago, we asked about two noble Order. properties in the Green Belt. Okay. Can't hear the Leader of the Opposition, who duly has the floor, has the right to ask her question. And I must hear the member who has the floor. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. If you ignore my request to come to order, I will warn you. Okay, start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Just two days ago, we asked about two Nobleton properties in the Green Belt that the Premier's friend Shakira Matula wants to develop. Now, the Minister of Municipal Affairs replied and he said, quote, no changes were made to these lands. Only it turns out there were changes made to these lands, Speaker. The former minister changed York Region's official plan to allow private servicing to these Green Belt lands so they could be developed just as the Premier's friend wanted. And new evidence shows ministry staff assuring Ryan Amato that that's exactly what the changes to the official plan were for. They say, it's our understanding of the solution they were seeking. Question. So to the Premier, will his minister correct the record? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. You're right, Mr. Speaker. There were no changes made to that official plan, and the Leader of the Opposition will know that uh, uh, the Greenbelt changes were, uh, were we revoked the Greenbelt changes to the provincial plan, Speaker. That is a bill that uh, is, in fact, in front of this House and actually collapsed earlier today when the NDP did not want to carry on debate. I will correct my record Order. that it is not just two donations from developers that she calls sketchy, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that's the difference between them and us, right? We want to build homes. We don't call the people that build homes sketchy because the people that build homes are the same people that came to this country, worked really hard, came here with absolutely nothing in their pocket, and have grown and done something for themselves and remarkable things for this community. So while they call them sketchy, I don't think a person like Giancarlo de Gasparis, who gave $1,000 to the NDP, is sketchy. I think he's a person who works hard, and Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to support those who are building homes for the province of Ontario and thank them for doing so. Order. Order. The supplementary question. Speaker, it's, it's pretty clear the only thing this government is sorry for is the fact that they got caught. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, documents show that the Premier or a member of his staff wanted to make sure that the Premier's friend, Mr. Ramatula, could develop these Greenbelt lands in Nobleton. On November 4th, Mr. Amato wrote, and I'm going to quote, Premier's office has asked me for a picture to make sure it's captured. So back to the Premier. Who in the Premier's office was so interested in these Nobleton Greenbelt lands and why? Well, well, Mr. Speaker, like the minister said, uh, everything was rescinded. So, but what I'm concerned about, how deep they're involved with the public sector unions, like Fred Hahn, that's an anti-Semite, by the way, that's donating money to you, order, donating money to you to the maximum amount. What do you owe? What, what do you owe Fred Hahn? That's my question. Extra deals, backroom deals, giving you more money? 
Excuse you know, me. but again, I'll tell you one thing. Order. He, he supports Hamas. You know he does. He said it publicly. He's disgusting as far as I'm concerned. And he's a supporter of your order. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Order. 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 I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, you can tell they're running scared, eh? <laughs> the, the integrity commissioner. Order. Is a, this is a government speaker that is under criminal investigation by the RCMP, and they won't even take these questions seriously. The Integrity Commissioner reported that Mr. Ramatullah's request for changes to these Greenbelt lands in Nobleton caused quite a stir among the minister's political staff. I, I think this is actually the first time I've ever seen the F word written in a report tabled by an independent officer of the legislature, Speaker. The report does not explain Order. why the minister's political staff would give so much attention, so much attention to a request from Mr. Ramatula. So back to the Premier. Did he or any of his staff direct the ministry to make these changes that benefited his close friend? The people of Ontario deserve an answer. Please take their seats. Minister of and Housing. Speaking now, uh, Mr. Ramatula is building homes in Stouffville, homes that are supported by the town of Stouffville, by the city of Markham, homes for seniors, Mr. Speaker, homes that are so important in our community. Now, the leader of the opposition called Mr. Ramatula a sketchy developer. I wonder if she felt that way when he was giving a $2,000 donation to the NDP. Was he sketchy? Because I don't think he is. I think he's a hard-working home builder. I apologize to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. I can't hear you. I'm going to ask the members to uh, allow the minister to make his response so that I can hear him. Start the clock. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yeah, yeah you, you have the leader of the Liberal Party uh, chiming in, right? You have the leader of the Liberal Party chiming in. See, here's the difference, Speaker. We're not calling the people who build homes for the people of the province of Ontario sketchy. Here, here, the here. NDP and the Liberals are. They're, they're pleased to take money take from the them, money. but in the very same breath, call them sketchy. If they believe that, then stand in your place, return the money that you receive, Mr. Speaker. We think that the people who build homes are the people that we should Bonds. be supporting, and we aren't going to stop because we need them to build one. 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Okay. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, after a decade of Liberal scandals, this Conservative government came in promising transparency, but since then we have seen the most egregious displays of preferential treatment from a government in Ontario's history. Apologies ring hollow when everyday new details trickle out that show we don't yet have the full truth about the Premier's involvement in these donor deals. Can the Premier please tell us how we, he will increase the powers of the Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General to bring an end to Conservative and Liberal scandals? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Mr. Uh, again, to the member opposite, it's actually not the Premier who makes that decision. It's Parliament that makes that decision, Mr. Speaker, and it is parliamentarians that will decide the powers of the Integrity Commissioner and, uh, and the Auditor General, Speaker. But at the same time, I wonder, for Hamilton Mountain, I wonder if uh, Julian de Gasparis is sketchy, because the opposition NDP, of course, accepted a $1,000 donation from him. Uh, 
as well. I don't think so, Mr. Speaker, because unlike the opposition, who call the people that build homes, build infrastructure uh, for the people of the province of Ontario, the I don't think come to order. Mr. Speaker. You know what I'm proud of? I'm proud of people who have come to this country with literally nothing and have built something for themselves and then have turned that passion into building for other people. Bonds. Generations of Italians like this family and other families, Mr. Speaker, have came here, started with nothing, and have done amazing things, Mr. Speaker. We'll support them because we need 1.5 million homes. Order. The supplementary question. The Premier, the government House leader says that it's Parliament that decides on the rules for the integrity commissioner. This, this Conservative government already voted down a motion to strengthen the powers of the Integrity Commissioner that the NDP brought forward. Yeah. This, aft <laughs> this afternoon, the NDP will be tabling a bill that will make some vital reforms to our democratic system, the most important of which will be to finally ban preferential treatment under the Members' Integrity Act. Nice. This will mean no more billion-dollar greenbelt grabs for Conservative donors, no more shady bidding processes leading to a 100-year giveaway of public parkland at Ontario Place. This government has to work for everyone, not just the Premier's insider friends. If you agree, will this government support the NDP's motion? Please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Motions, Mr. Speaker. That's what the NDP do, right? They bring motions. Well, what this side does is bring bills to the House, and we debate bills that it can actually make change for the people of the province of Ontario. I wonder if his motion will include the unions that support him and that are anti-Semitic. Probably not. They'll continue to take money from those very same unions, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if it will include people like Michael DeGasparis, who also gave $1,000 to the NDP, Mr. Speaker. Order. Now, let's get this straight. The people that they call sketchy, the very same Order. people who probably build the roads or the houses that they're living in and driving in, they're sketchy. You build in Ontario, the NDP think they're sketchy, Mr. Speaker. If you worked hard to build wealth for yourself, they think you're sketchy. If you came here in this, to this province with nothing, Mr. Speaker, and are contributing back Response. to your communities, they think they're sketchy, but they'll hold their hand out, take a check, Mr. Speaker, and then call you sketchy here. We're just 15 minutes into this. We've got 45 minutes to go. We're doing the public's business. People are watching. People are in the visitors' gallery. The pages are here. A number of members have repeatedly ignored my requests to come to order. I'm going to start warning them if it persists. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ever since this government was elected, we've been working to make life more affordable for people in Ontario. And to this end, we even fought the carbon tax all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Now the federal government has finally admitted that the carbon tax which we knew all along hurts people in the province of Ontario. Unfortunately, the federal government has only taken steps to exempt a small number of people in Atlantic Canada from the carbon tax. However, what about us in Ontario? What are we, second-class citizens? I want to ask the Minister of Energy, would he share his views on the federal government's decision to exempt only a small number of people from the carbon tax and not the province of Ontario. Great question. <laughs> Minister of Energy to reply. Speaker, uh, like the member from Essex, I can't understand why the federal government is leaving Ontario out in the cold. It just doesn't make sense, especially when half of the federal Liberal caucus 
comes from the province of Ontario, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. It's quite shocking. You know, the Prime Minister, though, this time last week did finally admit what everybody in this House should know is that the carbon tax is making life more unaffordable for the people of Ontario and more unaffordable for people from coast to coast to coast across this country. As the Premier said in the House on Monday, the parliamentary budget officer has indicated that it's costing significantly more for the people of Ontario and the people of Canada, and it's only going to get worse as the carbon tax goes up and up and up, Mr. Speaker. So despite having all of this information and that Response. knowledge that the carbon tax is making life more affordable, why does the current Ontario Liberal Caucus of nine continue to vote against motions calling on the removal of carbon tax from grocery? Thank you. The supplementary question. I thank the Minister of Energy for that answer. You know, it's truly shameful, shameful that the Liberals and the NDP in this House continue to work against us and won't work with us to make life more affordable for people in Ontario. We've tried time and time again to raise awareness about the carbon tax and its harmful impact on things like groceries and gasoline, but the Liberals and the NDP continue to fight against us and disrespect those concerns. They do nothing to help us bring life more affordability in the province of Ontario and continue to add additional financial burden to people who work hard. Speaker, please, I'm asking the minister to share his views on the harmful impacts that the carbon tax has on hardworking people here in the province of Ontario. And to reply, the Minister of Energy. Speaker, thanks to the member from Essex again. Like you, I hope the Ontario Liberals that are now down to nine members in this House can see the harm being caused to Ontario because of the carbon tax, something that they've supported every step of the way, Mr. Speaker. Fortunately for them, uh, the Liberals have a cherished history of uh, saying one thing and doing another. The Prime Minister once told us that families would get more back from the carbon tax than they would pay. We now know, thanks to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, that that's not true. Uh, Liberal Cabinet Minister Stephen Guibault once said, it wouldn't be fair for the rest of the Federation if we started carving out exceptions for provinces, but that's the direction that the federal Liberals have gone, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the members of the Ontario Liberal caucus and the federal Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, is why are they so opposed to making life more affordable Response. for the people of Ontario? Stop the clock. Well, once again, I'll remind the members to uh, make their comments through the chair, and uh, questions normally go to the provincial government <laughs> from other members. <laughs> Start the clock. Member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. On Monday, Toronto Paramedic Union issued a code red to indicate that no ambulance was available to respond to emergency calls. That was their second code red in October. During that period, a 98-year-old woman waited unconscious over 28 minutes wow. for an ambulance to end up being dispatched from Peel. Can the Minister tell us if an elderly woman unconscious waiting for 28 minutes for an ambulance is quality care? Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And of course, the member opposite knows I cannot speak to specific cases. I was not in the dispatch Order. center, nor was she, and she was not there on the scene. What I will say, and she knows full well, that ambulance dispatch in the province of Ontario is a seamless system, which means wherever you are in the province of Ontario, the closest ambulance to you will assist you. Now, having said that, we have ensured through working directly with our ambulance and paramedic uh, experts to make sure that we have put in additional programs and supports, including, of, of course, always there as a 50-50 partner with municipalities <coughs> as they expand their uh, ambulance uh, services, um, whether that is personnel or, of course, vehicles. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, it was Kitchener-Waterloo facing a paramedic code red when 10 ambulances were waiting at St. Mary's General Hospital in Kitchener to offload their patients. Speaker, some patients had to wait up to eight hours 
for an ambulance from a surrounding region to come and help. Minister, is this the level of care that the good people in Waterloo can expect from Doug Ford's Ontario? Take your seat. Once again, remind members to refer to each other either by their writing name or their ministerial title as applicable. I recognize the Minister of Health to reply. Speaker, you know, I'm proud to say under the, the leadership of our Premier and our government, we have been able to expand not only the number of ambulance uh, paramedics who are actually being trained in the province of Ontario through a learn and stay program that ensures that and as we train additional paramedics in our college and university post-secondary system, we are covering their tuition and their books in exchange for practicing in other under-covered under, uh, coveraged areas. Uh, we also, of course, expanded 911 models of care. Um, this actually ensures that that paramedic can make an assessment, work with the patient, and make sure that they have options other than the emergency department. Look, I know that the NDP have categorically stated that they, they don't want to see Response. any change in our health care system, but the truth is we are making changes that are Order. impacting people's lives and making sure that services are available closer to home. Order. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The independent Liberals and the opposition NDP members in this House support increasing the federally imposed carbon tax. They know that increasing the carbon tax will result in a significant spike in fuel prices, setting off a chain reaction of increased costs across our economy. For instance, the cost of manufacturing raw materials will increase dramatically. Businesses, particularly those in rural, remote, and northern communities are already struggling to keep prices affordable for their customers. We must do everything we can to reduce taxes for all Ontarians during this period of economic uncertainty. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax is negatively impacting Ontario's natural resources sector? Thank you. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry to reply. You know, uh, speaker, yesterday I had a chance to talk about how negative the carbon tax was on the forestry sector and how the cost of the carbon tax is now getting built into every home in Ontario. That means every bolt, screw, two by four, fence screw board, it's got carbon tax in it. And that's, you know, it doesn't need to be that way. It can be a lot simpler than this. Our Premier and our Finance Minister showed the way again this week of how easy it is to reduce taxes and reduce that burden. So the federal government needs to step up and do the same thing. We, we heard yesterday from the OFIA, our Forestry Industry Association, how damaging the carbon tax was for them. Here's what they had to say about the fuel cut. This has a significant impact on small businesses and their employees operating in northern, rural and indigenous communities in Ontario. It's easy. It's easy to do it. And our friends across the way here, Mr. Speaker, they can pick up the phone. They can send an email. Maybe they got some carrier pictures. Order. The minister will take his seat. Remind the members when the speaker stands. You sit. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The carbon tax raises the price of everything. I simply cannot understand why the opposition would support such a regressive carbon tax that makes building anything so much more expensive. It causes prices to rise across the board, which puts a heavy burden on our businesses. Because of the carbon tax, businesses are left with a tough choice. Either absorb the extra costs themselves or pass them on to their customers. And while the independent Liberals and the opposition NDP have no problem with the regressive carbon tax, it is not fair or right that Ontario families, workers and seniors are being punished. Speaker, can the minister please explain what impact the carbon tax has on our economy and our businesses? Thank you. Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, you know, yesterday, the other thing I spoke about was the aggregate sector and how every time we load up a truck with aggregates and take it to a project, there's carbon tax embedded in that load of aggregates. And this, this has got to stop, Mr. Speaker. Let's think about how many loads of aggregates go into projects. For one kilometre of subway building, 4,500 loads. To build a, a hospital, 70, uh, 37 hundred loads of aggregates. You know, I left off the great minister of education and the schools that he wants to build in Ontario yesterday. What's in those now? Carbon tax. You know, we could do more if we had more here in Ontario, but the federal Liberal government insists on charging a carbon tax on every single thing we do. It's insidious, but it has to stop. We are doing such a great job in building Ontario. Municipalities are impacted as well, by the way, in the work that they do. This this tax is easy to stop. Hey, it hey. just takes a phone oh, call oh. from our friends here Carbon in Ontario. Let's scrap the tax, get it done, help Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. My question is to the Minister. Raised by veterans' organizations and residents alike, there's a gap in how the Ministry of Transportation honours our veterans. The exclusion the exclusion of RVs and green electrical vehicles from the Veterans License Plate Program. Today, I will be tabling a clear solution. Expand the program to all vehicles. Our veterans' serv service is, inval is invaluable, and our gratitude shouldn't be limited by their choice of vehicle. Mm -hmm. Minister, let's close this gap together. Will you work with me to ensure all veterans can display the veterans' poppy license plate, guaranteeing equal rec recognition for their service to our nation and our country? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Absolutely, I'll work uh, with the member. Uh, as the uh, a member from Aurora Oak Ridge and Brain has had this conversation with me uh, er earlier a couple of weeks ago as well, I'm committed to, to working with uh, all members uh, of this House to ensure uh, that that is something that we can work towards. It is of uh, utmost importance uh, to myself, and uh, thank you for raising it, but also to my, my colleague as well, who has been working with me on this uh, for the past uh, uh, couple of weeks uh, as well. Thank you. Restart the clock. Member for Ottawa Centre. Well, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. It's nice to hear good news in this House, I have to admit, because uh, Sam Ludmer, a veteran who's watching, hi Sam, back home in Ottawa Centre, was the first person who raised this matter with me. He's frustrated that as he has made the shift to an electric vehicle, he can't display his pride in being a veteran on its license plate. So, uh, Minister, good to hear that we've got an opportunity to work together on this. And Sam, I want to thank you for taking the time to push politicians to do the right thing, because look what you just did. You've created unanimity in this place. So can we get once more for the record, Minister, a commitment in this House as Remembrance Week approaches to work with the opposition to do the right thing and make all vehicle license plates available to be proudly displayed with veterans license today. 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 Members may take their seats. My members to make their comments through the chair. To reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my uh, colleague from Ottawa Centre as well as St. Catharines for their question and for bringing this important point and question to the Minister of Transportation. I want to thank the Minister of Transportation for meeting with me earlier to hear my, uh, my uh, suggestion on this. And to the member of St. Catharines, as the Premier said, I want to thank you very much to you and Jonathan. Please convey our gratitude for the service that he's providing to us. Mr. Speaker, every man and woman in uniform sacrificed today, past and present, has and continues to sacrifice for us, Mr. Speaker. We will not forget them, which is why we expanded the Soldiers' Aid Commission by 600 per cent to $1.55 million to include past and present those who serviced and continue to serve our country. Mr. Speaker, which is why we removed the property tax for all Legion House. Mr. Speaker, those that have served us under the leadership of Pre our Premier Ford and our government will not be forgotten. We will continue to have their backs today and in the future. Mm -hmm. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this question is for the Minister of Health. A good portion of the most vulnerable residents in Ottawa live in my riding, especially in the Vanier and Overbrook neighbourhood. But access to primary health care is cruelly lacking. The good news is that there are solutions. A group of nurse practitioners has submitted an efficient plan for a nurse practitioner-led clinic that would provide primary care to 10,000 residents. In order to make this a reality, however, they need this government to do their part and provide the necessary funding. If the government is willing to pay in and $8.3 billion of taxpayers' money to pave over the green belt that led to a criminal investigation, can the government find enough money to provide primary care to those in need, unless this is not a priority for the government? So I'll give the minister Question. a chance to explain where the ministry is in the process of approving these critical projects so that Ontarians can have access to primary health care. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Okay, in the minister, in the member's own question, she talks about how we have in fact made an investment. We have asked for expression of interest. We have had literally hundreds of applications come in. We are making those assessments. So at one hand, she acknowledges that through our Your Health plan, we've made an investment and a commitment to expand primary care across Ontario. And yet now she is suggesting that we are not doing that. Which is it? Because we've made the investment, we are assessing those applications as we uh, speak. We are, as I said, the largest expansion in multidisciplinary primary care teams in the province's history, and we're doing that work. Were you there? Were you supporting it when we put that in our Your Health Plan and budget? The short answer is no. no. Again, I remind the members to make the comments through the chair. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the need for primary care in my riding of Ottawa Vanier is huge. It's a huge priority and it's been the number one issue ever since I was elected. Currently, there are no community clinics in Vanier or Overbrook to provide primary care. The only option for people is to go to wait and definitely in an emergency room or pay for health care with their credit card. When the Ministry of Health put out a call for proposals, people started to hope, and several groups submitted proposals to create clinics to provide much-needed access to care. However, it's been months, months and months of waiting, and none of them have yet been approved. In the meantime, the situation keeps getting worse. When will the minister start approving the proposals for primary care practitioners so that residents can get access to the primary care that they Question. need now? Minister of Health. Thank you. So the expression of interest came in mid-June. We are making those assessments with literally hundreds of applications. And a member who is representing a party that for 15 years did nothing to expand primary care in the province of Ontario, and in fact, Speaker, actually cut Order. the number of residency positions Order. that were available for new docs and new physicians who were wanting to practice and train in the province of Ontario. I will take no lessons from that member on how to improve health care in the province Order. of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. The carbon tax is hurting our farmers, hurting our families, and hurting our businesses. <clears throat> Unlike the independent Liberal members and opposition NDP, our government has always known that the carbon tax drives up energy prices across the province. That is why it is unfair that the federal government is choosing to exempt certain parts of the country from the carbon tax while punishing others. During this time of economic uncertainty, Ontarians deserve respect and fairness when it comes to affordability. Speaker, yes. can the minister please explain why the federal government is only taking action to help a small number of Canadians regarding the carbon tax exemption and ignoring Ontario? Minister of Energy. Speaker, to the member from Carleton, it's pretty obvious the federal Liberals have looked at the polls and they didn't like what they saw, and uh, that's why they acted, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, after years of saying that it would return 
more in benefit to those across the country. They're now realizing that that's simply not the case, that the carbon tax is driving up the price of everything, as the men a member mentioned. But to exclude only home heating oil, which affects a vast majority of residents in Atlantic Canada and only 2.5% of those who use home heating fuel in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, while ignoring the 70% who use natural gas or propane, Mr. Speaker, is just unforgivable. It's an open admission. It's an open admission, first of all, that uh, the federal government wasn't telling us uh, the whole cold truth uh, for years. And uh, for all those years, our government's been standing up time and time again fighting the federal carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Response. We've been making life more affordable for the people of Ontario by driving down heating costs, by driving down the price of gasoline, by making electricity more affordable, Mr. Speaker. When will the Party stand with us? The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. The people of Ontario deserve to have their concerns about the harmful impact of the carbon tax heard and raised. And as you've said, our government has known for years that the carbon tax was raising the cost of everything. Our government has consistently communicated this information. However, the independent Liberals and opposition NDP were content to sit back and see Ontarians slapped with another tax. This is wrong, unfair, and unacceptable to the hardworking individuals, families, and businesses in our province. The carbon tax makes life more expensive for everyone in every part of Ontario, especially in the north. Speaker, through you, can the minister please share his views on how devastating this regressive tax is for the people of Ontario? Thank you. Thanks, uh, minister of Energy. Speaker, the chickens are coming home to roost for the federal Liberals. It happened to the provincial Liberals a number of years ago, and I know that people across the province are looking at these two opposition parties and are as disappointed as I am that they continue to support a carbon tax that's driving up the price and cost of living in Ontario. We've stood in this House over and over again fighting the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, and over and over again they've been saying that we were fear-mongering. Well, Mr. Speaker, the price of everything is going up. We're not done fighting for the people of Ontario, and the good member from Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston is going to be presenting a motion a little bit later on this month, Mr. Speaker, to give the opposition parties another chance to stand up for the people of of Ontario. He's bringing forward a motion to eliminate the carbon tax on fuels and inputs for home heating for people across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I want to know. They've got time to think about it. Will they be supporting the member of the PC caucus's motion to eliminate the federal carbon tax? Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, MELT stands for Mandatory Entry-Level Training. It's Ontario's standard for transport truck driver schools. The goal is to replace licensed mills with excellent training for drivers. Unfortunately, there's still some dodgy companies not meeting the MELT standards. And how do they get away with it? Well, the ministry only has eight inspectors monitoring 582 vocational schools. 260 of these schools provide transport truck driver training. Basically, Speaker, these eight inspectors are set up to fail. My question, Speaker, uh, is that we all know that putting untrained drivers on the road is dangerous. My question is, will the Conservative government commit to hiring enough inspectors to ensure full compliance of transport truck driver training schools? Thank you. To reply, Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Safety in the transport industry and across all of our roads is uh, the utmost priority for this government. Uh, and that is why when it comes to commercial licensing, Mr. Speaker, we have some of the most robust uh, processes and licensing uh, and training uh, in the entire country, and, and in that fact, across North uh, America. It includes a minimum of 103 hours of instruction and covers uh, a variety of issues from entry-level knowledge, skills, uh, and uh, those practicals needed, the skills needed to operate uh, large trucks on Ontario's uh, roads, Mr. Speaker. Our enforcement officers, MTO enforcement officers, uh, run across this province, ensuring that our roads uh, remain safe. And I want to appreciate uh, all the work that they do day in and day out, uh, supporting the safety uh, of our highway and transportation networks across this province. And the supplementary question, the member for Thunder Bay. Thank you. Drivers are traveling across the entire province without seeing a single inspection station that is open. While MTO and OPP blitzes have led to charges being laid, drivers need to be stopped earlier and more frequently.
The lack of proper training and lax enforcement of truck safety is resulting in horrific crashes and constant highway closures. We know there is a new superstation opening up on Highway 1117 in Shunia, but on other major routes, inspection stations remain closed, as they have been for years. Will the government finally commit to staffing inspection stations across the province so that the highest possible standard of safety is enforced on our highways? And again, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, Ontario does have the highest standards of safety when it comes to, to not only the transportation sector but uh, our roads across uh, Ontario. We lead North America and this country uh, by example, and we'll continue to ensure that we have a rigorous not only training process uh, for commercial vehicles, but also ensure that our inspectors that are out on the road have the resources to be able to continue um, in carrying out those uh, inspections, Mr. Speaker. The truckers uh, uh, carry a lot uh, of uh, weight during uh, this time, and uh, we want to make sure that our roads are safe and that we support our trucking industry uh, through this uh, as well. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, over 103 hours are required in a comprehensive training before a truck driver is licensed. Inspections happen all across this province every single day at Fonts. scales uh, across uh, Ontario, and we will continue to ensure that we work uh, together with all members of this House to improve safety on our roads. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. As a small business owner herself, the minister knows personally that starting and operating a business takes immense effort, and entrepreneurs are constantly balancing the cost, uh, and any additional burden can have a massive impact. Uh, so, sadly, Speaker, the businesses in my riding are telling me that they are facing unprecedented economic challenges due to the carbon tax and high interest rates. While the independent Liberals and opposition NDP are willing to support this regressive carbon tax, our government believes that penal penalizing businesses in this way is unacceptable. So, Speaker, can the minister please explain why the negative effects on the carbon tax on small businesses in Ontario are doing such a negative impact uh, to the people? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Thornhill and the great work and the advocacy she does for Ontario's constituents and job creators. Speaker, small businesses are the heart of our province, sending vital goods and performing essential services throughout all of our neighbourhoods. That's why our government is steadfastly opposed to the federal carbon tax, a policy that disproportionately hurts small businesses and the families that they feed and support. Whether it's a mom-and-pop shop struggling with higher fuel delivery costs or a manufacturer seeing production expenses rise, this carbon tax amounts to an unfair penalty on Ontario's job creators. The NDP and Liberals talk about affordability, but time and time again they side with a carbon tax proven to damage our economy, eliminate jobs and weaken communities right across Ontario. If they truly Response. stood with entrepreneurs, they would join us in calling on the Prime Minister to remove this job-killing tax. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for being such a progressive advocate for the small businesses and entrepreneurs in Ontario. This regressive carbon tax hurts uh, the very people that any government should be helping. And the carbon tax hurts the farmers who grow the food, the truckers who move the food, the restaurants who serve the food, and the consumers who buy the food. Even worse, Speaker, it is Ontario entrepreneurs and our small businesses that are forced to shoulder increased costs because of this regressive tax and rising interest rates. At a time when concern for economic security and cost of living is so high, the last thing Ontarians need is higher taxes. Speaker, can the minister please explain why removing harmful taxes like the carbon tax is so vital to helping support our small businesses? 
Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for the question. I know firsthand the sacrifices entrepreneurs make and the challenges that they face each and every day. That is why I was proud to see the Premier and the Minister of Finance stand up for both businesses and consumers by extending the gas tax cut until June of 2024. For small businesses and families, every dollar counts. By keeping an extra $260 in people's pockets, this tax cut will allow residents greater ability to support local small businesses, whether buying goods or supporting a local restaurant. For businesses themselves, cheaper fuel means lower transportation expenses, allowing them to save elsewhere, whether it's delivering products to stores and customers, commuting employees, or other necessities. Speaker, small businesses, Response. including businesses in all of their ridings, shouldn't be paying Ottawa more just to get less. We call on the NDP and Liberals to join us and tell the federal counterparts that hard-working Ontarians desperately need money more now in their pockets. Ask the tax now. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Residents of Flamborough Glanbrook are calling on the government to shut down the Stony Creek dump. The industrial dump has wreaked havoc on their neighbourhood. The lingering stink has caused health issues, ruined outdoor play, and forced residents to keep their windows closed. A local mom wants the Premier to know her kids cannot play outside because the putrid smell is so awful. And now a plan for a much-needed elementary school is paused. Yes. Residents have had enough. They feel they've been misled by developers while purchasing million-dollar homes. GFL is a lucrative business who have moved their own business offices off-site. When will the Premier look out for this thriving community and shut down the dump? To reply, Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Speaker. And uh, certainly, I, I share the concern of those families, and uh, my heart does go on to to them. Uh, I know they haven't been able to have a summer uh, like uh, many uh, other families have had because of this issue. Uh, and as soon as I learned about the issue from the member of Flamborough, Grand Blue has, has um, had huge leadership on this front. Um, we've been sure talking to GFL almost every every day on this issue, uh, talking with officials on the ground to take action to ensure that this issue is resolved. And I will say that the Premier uh, is very much has his attention on this file as well. Uh, I've spoken to the Mayor of Hamilton, and let's be clear, Speaker, we want to get to the bottom of this issue and ensure that we're taking every action necessary. An order has been issued for this landfill to take serious action, to take swift action to resolve the matter. I'm happy to share a copy of the order with the member opposite. Supplementary question. The member for Hamilton West, Ancaster, Dundas. Thank you very much. The Ministry of Environment approved the expansion of the landfill in 2019 against the wishes of the community and the city who voted against the expansion. And at that time, the ministry said the environmental impacts would be appropriately managed. So quite obviously, this dump is not being properly managed. Now the ministry says the foul odour residents are experiencing is unacceptable. They've received over 900 complaints in six months. The city is exasperated and has called for a veto on any future expansions. One area councillor said, if the landfill odours can't be contained, the dump must be closed. And that's what the residents are asking for. So, Premier, why do the profits of a private conglomerate like GFL matter more than the health and well-being of Stony Creek residents? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Let's be clear. This, uh, this government takes the health and safety of all Ontarians, no matter where they live. And again, I want to thank the member for Flamborough Glenbrook for bringing this very important issue to my attention. We've been taking action every day. We will continue to be on top of this until it's resolved. We take it very seriously. And I do have a copy of the order in front of me right here, where we have taken serious action. We'll take whatever is necessary to get the issue resolved for these listen residents answer, who do dissolve a resolution. And I've been answer. working with the mayor, who's very uh, up to speed with what we're trying to do to ensure that this action is taken so that residents can get back to their day-to-day -day lives. So I will be passing on a copy of this order with a page to the members opposite. Thank you. Okay. Order. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Oh. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the member of Bay of Quinte, also the Minister of Energy. Oh. We've spent much of this week talking about how the carbon tax is raising the cost of everything. Everything. In fact, my father, who lives in the Bay of Quinte riding, called me and said that he'd heard that the Bank of Canada and the federal government have now acknowledged that what we've been saying for years, the carbon tax is harmful to the people of Ontario. Yep. In response for my father, that's what our government has been working diligently to find practical solutions to Ontario's, to make Ontario's electric grid not just more affordable, but also cleaner and more reliable. Mm -hmm. Speaker, can the minister please share information so that my father knows about what actions our government is taking to reduce energy and reduce costs for everyone in Ontario? Minister of Energy. All right, so this one's for Ron this morning down in Prince Edward County. Uh, listen, I'm pleased to talk about all of the initiatives that our government has undertaken, not only to make life more affordable, to, but also to drive down emissions across our province, Mr. Speaker. You don't have to do what the Liberals did and are doing in making life more affordable to drive down emissions, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, introduced a clean home heating initiative, which makes hybrid heat pumps available to natural gas customers in various locations across the province, Mr. Speaker, something we think the federal Liberals should support us on as well. We've introduced the ultra-low overnight rate, Mr. Speaker, for those who have and are considering buying an electric vehicle so they can charge at off-peak times in the overnight period, saving themselves money. We've introduced the green button standard right across the province at local distribution companies, giving customers the opportunity to reduce their bills by having the data they need by up to 18 per cent, Mr. Nice. Speaker. What else have we done? We've reduced the electricity rate through the Ontario Electricity Rebate for customers between 15 and 17 per cent, and of course, taking 10 cents off a litre at the gas pumps too, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that. My father is going to thank him as well when he sees him. Yep. It's great to see that there are better ways to fight climate change while ensuring that all household budgets are also respected. That's right. It seems obvious that the federal carbon tax was always short-sighted and simply was wrong. Yep. Our government knows that making life more affordable needs to be a top priority, but that doesn't mean we can't also reduce emissions at the same time. These initiatives prove that it's possible to oppose a carbon tax while continuing to fight c climate change. Taking money out of your pocket doesn't fight climate change. Ontario deserves both a healthy environment and a healthy economy. Speaker, can the minister please speak to the benefits of implementing energy solutions that help reduce costs for Ontario taxpayers? Minister of Energy. Uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question. The rationale behind the federal carbon tax was really to make life more expensive for those who use fossil fuels, Mr. Speaker, so therefore it's driving up the cost of everything. But we've taken substantive uh, actions here in the province to make sure that we're reducing emissions and making life more affordable at the same time. You know, it's a bit like Groundhog Day, listening to the member from Ottawa South talking about, you know, the things that we can do to reduce the cost of living when he votes against every single thing that we bring forward. The member from Ottawa South was a part of the caucus that introduced the Green Energy Act, one of the most harmful pieces of legislation in this province's history, Mr. Speaker. Their energy minister told us at the time it was going to cost a dollar more a month on electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. We know that that drove Response. people into energy poverty from every part of our province, Mr. Speaker, and reduced his caucus to a minivan caucus, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Sault Ste. Marie declared gender based violence as an epidemic, adding to more than 63 municipalities across Ontario which have formally declared this truth. To date, 2023 has seen more than 50 femicides, Speaker, more than one per week. All while this Conservative government continually fails to mobilize the resources from affordable housing to pay equity to community crisis and response funding needed to reverse this tragic course that Ontario is on. My question is back to the Premier. Will he take the first step 
to ending gender-based violence by declaring it as an epidemic, one requiring real action from this Conservative government. Thank you, Speaker. To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite. Let me be clear. There is no excuse for violent crimes. There is no excuse for intimate partner violence. And we take this matter very, very seriously. And as I said prior, we are engaging all partners, all partners to act. And we're doing so with a very broad lens. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we have invested over $55 million in various grants, including 45, including for supporting 45 victim services grants to help communities throughout Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we will also hold offenders accountable. And Mr. Speaker, we are taking further action at the Ontario Police College by having mandatory Spons. training for our cadets there to learn about intimate partner violence. In the end of the day, IPV is completely unacceptable. The supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Councillor Angela Caputo, who moved the unanimously adopted Sault Ste. Marie motion, has a message for this House after their recent and heartbreaking mass murder-suicide. I ask Premier Ford to reconsider the stance of his government. Angie Sweetney deserved better. These three innocent children deserved better. Women in this province deserve better. Speaker, on Monday, we were shocked, absolutely shocked, to hear the Solicitor General dismiss the top recommendation from the Renfrew inquest as an empty gesture of symbolism. My question to the Premier is, will he join the 63 municipalities who have already adopted similar motions by substantially declaring intimate partner violence an epidemic and committing the necessary resources to keep women and children safe in Ontario. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not exactly what I said. What I said was very clear, that declaring something and a medical term is not by itself action, and that's why our government Order. takes it very seriously. And our thoughts are with the families in Sault Ste. Marie for this heinous crime that was committed on them. It is undeniably tragic. But, Mr. Speaker, we, $55 million are being invested in programs that will have tangible benefits. Mr. Speaker, training at the Ontario Order. Police College will have tangible benefits. Supporting 45 projects through victim services grants will have tangible benefits. Holding the, holding the people Order. to account will. Monsieur le Président, tu as le droit. Mr. Speaker, everybody has the right to feel safe in their community. Mr. Speaker, for me, there is nothing more important than the safety of our province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Great, Minister. A month ago, the Bank of Canada reported that the federal carbon tax was responsible for a mere 0.15 percent increase in inflation. Researchers sought an explanation, only to discover that these calculations were not accurate. Now the figures have changed. The Governor of the Bank of Canada now says that the original number did not account for the years of tax increases and revealed that the correct impact of the carbon tax is actually four times Order. higher at 0.6%. It is clear that the federal Liberals and the Bank of Canada are out of touch when it comes to understanding the Order. harmful impact of carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this regressive tax is creating economic hardship for Ontario? Parliamentary Assistant, Member Four, Oakville. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you uh, to the member from Brantford Brant. And I'm I'm very happy that you're bringing this topic up because. 
Uh, nobody else in the House seems to bring it up. The opposition Liberals and NDP don't want to go here. Our government has led the charge, starting in 2018, to fight against this harmful carbon tax. We are proud that we have fought against this tax, Speaker, which we know would lead to poor outcomes for the people of this province. The carbon tax is sadly contributing to the overall inflation rate, which is growing rapidly in this province. That, in turn, yeah. is causing interest rates to go up. That, in turn, is causing Ontarians who have a hard time paying off their mortgages more money to pay every single month. If we can eliminate this tax, we can untangle our economy from the grips of inflation and make it easier for the people of Ontario to buy the goods and services that they require. This so. is why our government continues to urge the federal government, and we would love our opposition members right here in this Bots. house to join us and fight this punitive tax. Thank you. That concludes our question period for the